Uh, good morning and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today we're going to be going over best practices in accelerating FEA in different FEA engines such as Abacus, Ansys, and Nashtran NX. My name is Mark Musitano. I will be uh, emceeing this webinar today. With me today is Dr. Gil Sharon. He will be making the presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Gil. I'm the Senior Applications Engineer here at DFR Solutions. Today I'm going to be talking about how to uh, make the most out of your FEA engines, uh, FEA capabilities. This is really um, geared towards electronics, of course, and not general FEA. Um, thank you uh, very much for, to Mark for uh, agreeing to uh, be the Master of Ceremonies here. Um, who I am, those of you who don't know me, uh, I've done a little bit of research on uh, mechanical reliability of electronic components and systems. Uh, I've done a lot, mostly on component level, um, MEMS, and um, some stuff that is a little bit out there. Um, these days, I am the main uh, customer support and uh, customer advocate inside of DFR Solutions for our Sherlock users, uh, but I do a lot of development uh, as well. Um, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, this is kind of like the agenda. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what FEA does and wh how we kind of look at FEA on the board level reliability. Um, not really geared towards um, specific components uh, except for BGAs that I'm going to show you at the end. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the difference between boards and, uh, let's say, component level, which is mostly these things that have uh, solder uh, on the bottom, the BGAs. Um, I'm going to show you how to take a board and then put it into an enclosure. And it's kind of, uh, I'm not going to do everything for all four uh, engines. I'm just going to kind of show you, I'm going to try to hit at least every single one of the um, FEA options that are currently um, popular within most of our uh, customers. So I'm going to try to show you how to do a board inside of an enclosure for Abacus and Ansys Workbench, but then, you know, to add a stiffener, which is a little bit more, uh, a little bit simpler, I think, uh, I'm going to do that in Ansys Classic. I'm going to talk about Nastran as a solver. It's kind of our uh, new feature that came in uh, Sherlock 5.0, uh, and I'm just learning how to use it, so I'm not so heavy on the Nastran just yet. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, BGA packages uh, specifically. And um, v via modeling, I also have an extra little uh, morsel to show you. It's kind of a cool picture um, of things that you can do if you are really want to be dangerous. Um, so let me go right into the uh, overview. So in general, when we look at board design, we have several issues that we can simulate um, with FEA, that we kind of need to use FEA in order to simulate them. So you can do any of the harmonic, uh, um, any of the vibration issues, which is uh, random harmonic and natural frequency uh, analysis. So these are related to how the board performs in uh, a vibration load. You can also do things that are more like either single cycle or repetitive uh, cycles, but they're generally just like the board bends in a certain way. So it would either be a transient dynamic analysis or a static structural analysis when we're doing ICT. There's some more static structural things that we can do um, that have to do with board bending or maybe pin insertions, uh, assembly kind of things. But in, in general, these things are static structural and transient dynamic. And it's the most common ones are ICT and uh, mech shock. Um, and then we have thermomechanical induced stresses. So the biggest one, obviously, is going to be solder fatigue analysis. The uh, secondary one for the, um, that we've seen a resurgence of it uh, with using stacked vias and um, in general moving from plated through holes to plated through vias is stresses in the vias during reflow and doing warpage analysis, which is a little bit more, um, you know, package manufacturing, but we are also seeing warpage on the board level, especially with over-constrained boards, which we've been talking about at DFR for the last uh, two years, especially for the people doing uh, automotive uh, type boards. So this webinar specifically is going to concentrate on, you know, how you can leverage Sherlock 
to accelerate your analysis capabilities. But it's not like a Sherlock. Uh, it doesn't necessarily. You don't necessarily have to use Sherlock, and you don't necessarily have to use any one of the FBA engines that we're talking about. So for me, the process flow goes through Sherlock because Sherlock. That's the whole accelerating the FEA. Um, so the idea is to do um, faster and easier model creation. Um, when I talk about automated processing, so let's talk about FEA in general. When you have, when, hold on. So when you make a board or a BGA, um, on a board, your model is going to be, you know, components, the board. Um, in all kinds of stiffeners or things that you would put on the board, heat sinks, uh, wire bonds, if you're doing power modules that are board level uh, wire bonds. So for a regular FEA analyst that is not used to doing boards, when you go to your analysis group in your, in your company, it's going to be a little bit difficult because they are used to, let's say, doing cases or server racks. And they're a single material, usually. It's some kind of, you know, aluminum, steel, or plastic. And usually, you know, there's going to be a bunch of features like ribs and uh, circles, uh, like mounting conditions. So they're complicated geometries. They're complicated 3D geometries. The complication does not come from the materials, and it does not come from the part count, usually. Um, some people do have high part counts if they're doing large assemblies, but usually when you're doing FEA, it's, it's not that many parts to it, and there's not that many materials to it, and the materials are not exotic. And solder is a little bit of an exotic material, or copper, the way we use it in our leads, it's, um, we use it in the plastic region. So we do a lot of plasticity where usual structural analysis would say, Oh yeah, if you're going plastic, you need to stay way below the plastic limit. And we regularly will go into the plastic, um, into plasticity, for uh, especially for copper and solder. Um, so that's why it's it's better to automate the creation of components, leads, or you know BGA solder balls. Uh, it's better to automate uh, using maybe leveraging some libraries, which I'll talk about um, in in a moment but also how to standardize um, all of the packages, because our packages are standard. Most of them are standard. There's very little in electronics that is custom made. Um, and then for the, cop, uh, for the board itself, a lot of times I see boards that are basically just made out of one uniform material, and that's that, which is nice, which is fine. A lot of times it works, but we now have the ability to look at laminates, uh, at the resin and uh, calculate the copper either into a modified uh, properties that take into account the fact that it's a layered uh, uh, structure, so um, orthotropic layered structure, or um, just model each layer directly. And I'll show you how to do that. And even like the copper traces directly, and I'll show you a couple of ways of doing that. And then also adding stiffeners and mounts, that's obvious um, to all of us. Uh, in VGA, it's kind of the same. You have the uh, solder balls. A lot of time we have, I'm seeing a lot of custom patterns um, with balls that are depopulated or either they're redundant, uh, they're called anchor balls, um, at the corners or at the die shadow to prevent uh, early failures or that if that ball fails, it doesn't fail the package. Um, we usually have a laminate. There's usually a die in pretty much every DGA that I've seen. Even multi-chip modules, they'll have some component on the other side or else, you know, it's, there's no reason to make it. Um, and then there's either an overmold or a bare die. I've seen lidded packages as well, um, more uh, towards the flip chip uh, BGAs. Um, and then there's a bunch of passives. Uh, I'll also talk about package on package BGAs today a little bit. I'll show you a few pictures of how to do those. Um, and then when you do the laminate model, it's kind of the same as the board. You can either do uniform properties layer by layer or mosaic, which I'll show you as well. So that's kind of the framework that I'm talking about. So all of these things, they are usually, I mean, they can be custom, but they come from a template. So the, the custom 
pattern. There might be a custom pattern for the solder ball, but the solder ball is kind of all look the same. Um, so in Sherlock, the way to create a PCB, just that's the way we do it. We import the board directly from the ECAD file. You don't have to. You can actually do it, make the board yourself. But usually, I would say the easiest way to do it is to just import the board from the ECAD file, uh, verify where the components are uh, sitting with regards to location and rotation. Um, and that usually comes from some kind of pick and place file, the same kind of file that you would send to a pick and place machine. Um, you enter the component properties. Hopefully, you set up libraries correctly so that you can leverage uh, your library. Some of the components you do custom. Um, you verify the board properties through the stack up editor, and then you export the board to FDA. Let me show you what I mean. To import the um, files from an ODB, you just click, 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 um, bring in the ODB um, in total. Uh, you can verify the PCB layers came in correctly. You can verify the component locations on the uh, right side. Uh, you can, user can modify pretty much anything you want. Um, you can assemble boards together, you can stack them, you can uh, plug in boards into one another. Not a lot of people are actually doing that. You can attach heat sinks, you can uh, create cutouts, you can do um, uh, all kinds of uh, custom things as well. Um, stiffeners and so on, some, some kind of stiffeners, the simplistic ones. And then um, Let's take a look at the component placement. You can verify the component placement with either, I either do it with a copper layer or with the, um, the solder mask layers. In this case, I did it with the copper layers. And um, there was a question, uh, will this presentation be available? Actually, all of our presentations are available online, and I'll show you at the end where, where it's going to be available, so don't worry. Um, we also have a, you can verify each component one by one. You can do some bulk editing. Usually, if you're going to implement Sherlock or if you're going to implement any kind of FEA preprocessor, um, you probably want some kind of library that has all of the properties for the package because um, you don't want to enter it by hand. That's really like what I'm trying to avoid. avoid. Number one, I don't want mistakes to happen. Number two, um, I just want it to be done quickly. Uh, if you have a thousand parts on the board, entering each one of them by hand is not a fun uh, is not a fun day. Um, even if you don't export a component to FEA, just know this that Sherlock will still calculate the reliability of it. So it's important to put the component in the right place and to put the component uh, properties because Sherlock can still calculate reliability for a component based on strain on the board, the results that came in from FEA are the strain on the board, and um, it'll just take it the, a look at the location and look, take a look at the variables that are in the, um, in the part properties, and Sherlock can still give you a calculation for a reliability result. This is especially good for the really, really small packages. If you have a bunch of big packages, I would say don't worry about exporting the small packages. They don't really affect the overall board uh, response. Um, you can verify the board properties. In Sherlock, we do it layer by layer. You can actually select um, the laminate uh, material directly from our database. Um, you can create your own database of laminate materials. In my experience, most companies use around um, between five to seven different laminates across their entire product line. And I'm talking about huge product lines. Uh, so you shouldn't really have to do that much work on it. Um, it's better to put in your own measured properties than to use the Sherlock library because we do it off of data sheets and you all know that data sheets can be quite um, fickle. Um, Sherlock will calculate the overall CTE modulus and um, density for the entire board and the board thickness comes directly from the uh, ODB file and then after you set everything up, it's a simple right click to export the FDA model. You can select which option of FDA you want. You can uh, do um, Abacus export. You can do ANSYS export, uh, NASTRAN. Calculix is our own, um, is, the, is the FEA solver that comes with uh, Sherlock that is built into uh, every one of your installations. So if you're using the default, it would be a Calculix um, script. 
and then a step file. Um, the geometry that gets exported is all of the components that you have selected on the board. Um, it will create a mount point, a heat sink, wire bond of whatever you had on the board. Um, it'll include the PCB geometry with all the drill holes and cutouts according to the export FEA, you know, what, what options you did, just like the regular edit properties. Um, it will put all the co components in the correct location. It will assemble them in the correct location. So for both Abacus, Ansys, and Astran, it will put them in the correct location. You have the option to do a merged mesh, which is usually computationally more uh, easier to work with. Or you can do a tight contact surface uh, for everything, which is easier to mesh, but then the solver times sometimes get a little bit longer, especially when you have a thousand parts on the board, a thousand tight contacts. It can get a little bit um, heavy for the solver. But then again, that's the solver's problem, not really. It, if it's easier to mesh, I would rather go with tight contact surfaces um, wherever I can do it, whenever I can get away with it. And then the materials, just like the materials are defined in Sherlock, they get exported. Um, and then just like the materials we saw in the previous slide for the board, um, all of those get exported as well and applied to the board. And if you have layer by layer, then each layer material will be applied to the correct layer on the, the board, which is kind of nice because that takes care of about, you know, 80% of your problems when it comes to um, exporting FTA models. So here's a, here's a simple, you know, my tutorial board. And if you want the file for this enclosure, just let me know and I will send you the file. Um, I exported the uh, model as a step file. I imported it to ANSYS Workbench just like from the geometry import geometry. Um, I put in the external geometry file for the chassis and then I connected both of them together. In uh, ANSYS Workbench, I used the Sherlock plugin just like we have in our tutorials for or in our user guide for how to use ANSYS Workbench. Um, I, it brought in the materials for all the parts and for the board. Um, the case, of course, came in as a step file, so I had to apply a material for the case. I think I used steel. Um, ANSYS will automatically mesh the model and run the analysis, and it gives me, you know, the modes of the analysis for, for this board. And then I did the exact same thing using uh, Abacus. Uh, so uh, I did a Python script. You can see that this one is a, a tied contact uh, surfaces between the parts and the, uh, and the board. Um, and then I put the case around it just like um, with the regular Abacus uh, import part. Uh, and then I applied a material to it. I meshed it. I ran all of it. Um, and again, so this is the exact same file you see here. So I took the same files. It doesn't really matter if I'm using Ansys or Abacus. I ran it. Here's the board inside. So whatever this frequency was, so this is with the case. And if you look inside, this is what the board looks like inside. Um, after the analysis is complete, this works for both um, ANSYS and, uh, and Abacus exactly the same. After the analysis is complete, take a look at this board for a second. There you go. You see the exact same board as in Sherlock. Um, same uh, natural frequency, same everything. So everything comes in. And then you can use the regular uh, generate report um, structure in Sherlock to generate the report um, that you normally would get with uh, the ADA. So that saves you time on having to run things in Abacus and Ansys and then not being able to use the automated report. So now you can run things in Abacus and Ansys, bring it back into Sherlock, um, run, run a report on it. Uh, let's take a look at uh, a stiffener. So in this case, and again, it doesn't matter which solver I'm using. In this case, I'm going to use ANSYS APDL, which is the ANSYS Classic, which is different than ANSYS Workbench. I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm just going to export it. This time, you'll, you'll take a look right here. I'm just going to put, you know, whatever the file name is, .apdl. Um, here it is in uh, ANSYS APDL. Again, this is ANSYS Mesh and Constraint Equations uh, at all of the interfaces. Um, I just did a read input from, and this is what it looks like. I modeled an additional bracket right here, which would be a little bit difficult to model this bracket in uh, Sherlock, not that it's impossible. Um, so it, this is a different use case. This is not the enclosure. Um, I applied the loads in, uh, in, 
in ANSYS just like you normally would. This time I did a harmonic vibe analysis instead of natural frequency. I ran the analysis and I imported the results just like I showed you before to produce a reliability prediction. So this is the board, this is the board in ANSYS with the bracket. This is the board after I solved it, after I put it into Sherlock, and I got a reliability life prediction for it. And all I had to do was bring in the um, natural frequency um, um, results file and the harmonic vibe uh, results file. Um, in, in this case, I did harmonic vibe. Very, very um, simple to do all of this. If you do multiple boards and enclosures and complex um, interactions, this becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, so I talked about Abacus a little bit. I talked about ANSYS a little bit. Um, let me talk about NASTRAN even a little bit less. So NASTRAN is a relatively new feature, NX NASTRAN. I'm not exactly 100% sure on everything that has to do with it, but right now, um, without knowing anything about NASTRAN, and I'm a new user to NASTRAN, I can set Sherlock up in the FEA settings. I can set Sherlock to work with NASTRAN. I just have to uh, give it a path to where NASTRAN sits, and it looks like it works just fine over a server too. So if you have a NASTRAN solver on a server, um, you just need to find the path to it. Um, it'll do natural frequencies, ICT, random vibe, and harmonic vibe. What Sherlock does, it kind of uses it just like it uses, you know, the background processes, just like it does for Calculix, Abacus, and ANSYS. It can use NASTRAN as the solver in the background. So it, Sherlock will create an input file, a native NX NASTRAN input file. It will throw it into the NASTRAN solver. It'll solve it in NASTRAN. Well, NASTRAN will solve it in NASTRAN, which is very powerful, by the way, much better than Calculix. Um, and it will then bring the results back into Sherlock automatically and give you the results. I have seen someone else do it, one of our customers that we developed this for. They can actually open the NASTRAN file, add the enclosure around it, and do everything. I don't know how to do it just yet. I'm learning. Um, but it seems to work exactly the same as Abacus and ANSYS. Um, the GUI can open it, and then you would just need to save the new uh, bulk data file, and you'd need to save the new uh, PCH file, which is their result file, their version of result file, and just bring them in like you normally would, and it should work exactly the same as, uh, as Abacus or ANSYS. Um, and that's NASTRAN. Any questions about like the general board level um, uh, solvers integration that we have? This is a good time for it. If not, I'm going to bounce up to how to do BGAs. So this is a basic overmold BGA with a bunch of passives. You can see the passives right here on top. You can see the die right over here, and here's an overmold on top of it. This is a fully meshed model that was created in Sherlock, and now let's take a look. Let's take a deeper look into what we have here. We have a PCB. That's this big green guy. We have the laminate. That's the white uh, piece right over here. We have the overmold. That's the stuff that's um, kind of see-through. There's even a little straight here, which doesn't always exist. Some, some of them come right up to the uh, surface. Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, BGA balls on the bottom. And I'll tell you that this is a 10 by 10 uh, BGA, relatively simple BGA to do. It's very good for examples. Here is, I took the BGA, so here let me do this. I took this BGA, I disconnected it from the board, and I flipped it over so we can now see the balls, and here it is over here. So what I did this time, instead of just doing the laminate as one whole material, this blue stuff here is actually, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a layer here, a copper layer, a laminate layer, copper layer, laminate layer, copper layer, laminate layer. So all of the layers are actually represented. And if you take a look actually at this layer, this layer is from the BGA layout right here. And if you zoom into like this specific location, this copper trace right here, this copper trace right here, is this copper trace. Right here, and th there's that circle that the, the, 
the uh, BGA ball sits right on top of that circle. And you can see it kind of here. I took out the BGA ball so you can see them. And then this trace right over here that goes around is this trace that goes around. Okay? And then these two guys, this dog bone, is these two guys. So you can kind of see that you can get the actual layout. And this is very, very easy to do. And I think I imported this into, um, into Abacus. You can do the exact same thing with ANSYS as well. They, they work interchangeably. And this is the overmold. In this case, I, I, I eliminated the, the street and I cut the overmold so that it goes all the way to the surface of the uh, BGA. So you can do either option works for, um, for, uh, with Sherlock. And again, this is the Sherlock BGA layout. And just to, I know you can't see the picture, but trust me that the second row of copper right here, the second layer, also has the exact same thing with the mosaic on, on uh, all the locations, so you have a pretty good representation for the copper. This model is very good for package warpage, for predicting package warpage. Um, you don't need the balls for it, um, so you don't actually need all of these balls. They kind of, but they look cool, so, you know, I put them in there. But um, this is good for predicting package warpage. Um, it's not as good for, like, thermal mechanical, uh, I'm sorry, for thermal electric stuff, so anything that has to do with electricity might not be that good because you really do need uh, correct geometry for like EMI um, type things. Um, but any kind of thermal mechanical process is okay. Maybe even thermal as well might be for some of the thermal stuff as well. Um, especially if you're just heating the dye and you're trying to do like a heat transfer problem for uh, the dye. Let's take a look at another um, option for the BGA. So remember how I showed you that the BGA here has all of the uh, copper um, kind of elements? I can also do it so that the BGA only has, here's the same, um, same BGA ball. And by the way, to switch from one to the other takes exactly five minutes in Sherlock. So here's the BGA ball. Here are the um, each layer. So in this case, what I did was I exported each layer as one singular material instead of doing the mosaic. And instead, what I did was I took, so if you take this BGA ball and you connect it to the board, and now I'm looking at the top of the board without the BGA, I like took the BGA off. So you can see that I can actually do the PCB as well uh, as a mosaic. This is very computationally expensive. Um, I would not recommend it on a regular basis. And if you take a look, this trace right here is this trace right here. Okay, so you can see all the traces, and I think this one right here is this guy right here. You can see that I can do all the traces with no problem, and the BGA balls fall in exactly the same location. Um, I would say that if you have material properties from test, you should probably do it as a uniform material with the material properties that you have from the test. Um, it's better for simplification, but also because you can get away with a larger mesh size if you don't really uh, need to do the location-based material properties, which would be, again, very difficult to actually solve this thing. So um, we have different levels of complexity that you've seen. So I can do full uniform model I can do one side has a detailed, uh, detailed mesh based on the layout, and the other side is kind of like, you know, the board is whatever the board is, and then you can do it so that um, you do layer by layer, uh, uniform properties for each layer, and then any combination basically that you would like. And everything can line up, so it's really kind of nice. So let's talk about an example of a more complicated. So that was a very um, easy BGA to do, right? It was a simple BGA. Let's talk about a more complicated one. So this is a package on package BGA. And let me explain what you see here. This big green thing, that's the PCB. That's the original PCB. And then right here is the BGA. That's the, I just call it the regular BGA, because it's the one that connects via regular BGA balls with you know whatever pattern you have here but it connects your regular BGA balls to the board directly, to the top of the board. And then there's a die right here, and then a bunch of, um, usually they're in the perimeter, they're around the die, 
there's a bunch of more um, BGA balls. I call them the pop uh, solder. They're kind of the same as regular BGA balls, but I just, to distinguish them from these guys, I just call them the pop solder instead of the BGA solder. And then there's another uh, substrate here, which is can be exactly the same as the BGA substrate, another dye, and usually some kind of overmold on it. In a lot of cases that I've seen, this is the ASIC dye, so this is the logic dye, and this would be the memory dye. So the memory sits right on top of the package, and the whole thing thickness is whatever the thickness is, and you know the sizes are whatever the sizes are. Um, and the BG, the pop VGA does not have to be overmolded, but just because the pictures look cooler, I'm going to show you everything with the uh, package on package overmolded. So this is a real um, package on package VGA. Uh, it had thousands and thousands of balls. Uh, Sherlock, just to give you an idea of the limitations, Sherlock creates the VGA balls with a simplified geometry, like this. As many sides as you want on it. You can have 300 sides, you can have, usually I do like octagons, and then the one in the corner will have like 20 sides. Um, and then I would have to remesh and redo the detailed ball that I want to. But just to give you an idea of a recent um, project that I did, I had 2,600 BGA balls in total, and I did eight detailed balls, and the whole thing took me maybe three or four hours. The whole model, doing everything from scratch, from Sherlock, from you know, ECAD data, uh, directly took me about um, three hours. So it's not that hard to do, including the detailed uh, ball. So it's not that hard to do. Uh, it's definitely faster than anything it did that has taken me uh, before, doing this uh, by hand before. And you can get the actual uh, pattern that you want. So if we take a look at a simple uh, pop package, basically the pop BGA looks exactly like the BGA that we already know. There's a die, here's the overmold, you know, in this case I did layered um, uh, substrate, and then here are the BGA balls. And I just take this pop BGA and I sit it on top of the main BGA. The main BGA kind of looks like the pop BGA. The die is kind of smaller and there's no overmold, but it kind of looks exactly the same. And I just basically put them one on top of each other. And then I exported this entire assembly with the board, of course, um, into uh, Abacus and then into ANSYS. And you can see here the board is, you know, came out to be a green color and here it came out to be a red color, but um, they export just as well to Abacus or ANSYS and then um, you have options here of exporting it with the mesh, without the mesh, but essentially once you have this model here, it's up to you to mesh it. Sherlock kind of, the real power of Sherlock is to generate the geometry, and that's really where you can accelerate your design process. Um, even for non-FEA uh, users, and then at this point you would just hand it over to your, um, to your analyst and you tell them, Here's the model, mesh it and run it. So material properties have all been assigned, everything is placed in the right location, 100, 100 balls, no problem, 2,000 balls, no problem. Um, the only thing you would need to do is tell your FEA you know, person to mesh this and run it. Uh, and that's you know, what they pretty much know how to do. That's their like bread and butter. So that's the uh, BGA packages, and here's a zoomed-in example of the, what that pop BGA looks like um, at the end. Let me show you a little bit more via modeling. So until, let's say, like two or three years ago, and I would even go back as five years ago, it was prohibited, it was practically impossible to do full board via modeling, to like model every single, even for four-layer boards, it was practically impossible. It was too big. The model creation times were ridiculous. Uh, the solvers couldn't handle it. Um, nowadays, with cloud-based computing and servers that run solvers with no problem, and you know, it's a distant memory to all of you, but I remember buying time on uh, a supercomputer, and the supercomputer had like 300 CPUs. That was the largest, you know, computer. Nowadays, that would be, that's not even that impressive. Um, there are laptops out there with uh, 32 CPUs and uh, uh, 100 gigabytes of, uh, of memory. So it's not impossible 
to uh, run these models anymore. Um, the problem is how to, but the model creation time, that's engineer time. So you still have to sit there and click and make circles and then, and then um, make traces. There have been some automation, and I don't really care which automation method you use, but there has been some automation in, uh, in the work for us, for us right now. And the only thing that I would say has been a problem is really the model creation to a level that um, you can start running a whole board. And let me explain to you the problem. So let's take a look at this guy, OK? If you have a lot of layers, like this one is a 16-layer board, I would only do a portion of the PCB because if you try to do a high-layer count plus you want to do a very detailed mesh, you are going to run into trouble. And I did some, some of the calculation here. So if you take a 10 by 10 millimeter area with a 50 by 50 micron mesh size, which, by the way, 50 by 50 is not that small these days. The feature sizes are um, smaller than that. But even for 50 by 50, each layer of elements would have 40,000 elements, at least. So for an eight layer board, eight la layers of copper, that means a total of 15 layers of elements, and that's if you only have one element per layer, which a lot of times for the vias and for the, um, for the areas of interest, you want to have like at least three. But the minimal amount for a 10 by 10 area of the board would be 600,000 elements, which is not impossible, but that's a big problem. That's a big problem to solve. Now, what I'm showing you at the bottom here is a full uh, board, and it took me, um, it's about 2 million elements, and it took, you know, a day and a half to solve. But it's okay because I pressed enter and went home for the weekend. I came back on uh, Monday, and the whole thing was solved. Um, or I can send it directly to, you know, uh, Simulia, uh, which make Abacus, or directly to ANSYS, and ask them to put it through their uh, high power computing lab. I don't exactly know how much they charge, but they charge something. And um, they will solve it for you if you have the model already made. The problem is how to automate the creation of this model in such a way that it actually works for what we're doing. So to make a pretty picture is really, really easy. Mentor Graphics, Zook, and Altium, they all have some kind of 3D model create, creator that you know works OK. I'm going to say it works OK. But what we do is we take the original layout in the Gerber, and we will make it into Sherlock traces. And take a look at this circle. When we export a circle, you have the option, and I'll talk about this a lot more in, in the next couple of slides. When we take the circle, what's cool about this is that when you try to export this circle directly from your ECAD program, it's not built for people who are actually going to do FEA on it. It's built for people who just want to see a pretty picture we will defeature it into like an octagon or into a hexagon or something like that. We will defeature it. So instead of having, you know, 50 sides onto here, uh, you only have six sides, which means automatically the level of complexity of the model has gone down, but you still have all of the, um, all of the details that you want in order to run the FEA. So this is easier to mesh than an actual circle. So that's kind of nice. And especially for these traces that are kind of circular um, and have these weird um, corners in them or any of these copper planes that have these weird uh, circles in them. So we know how to defeature that pretty well. Now, if you take a look, we have these. In, when you create a trace model, Sherlock um, will, you, we have some edge detection, we have an algorithm, it was created here at DFR Solutions. It's actually very complicated. I wouldn't even do it any justice if I tried to explain it to you. Um, the geniuses behind it at our software team um, made it so that basically someone like me, who's not the most talented person in the world, can just click on these four things and select the size that I want, and it will take it from a very um, coarse features 
and you can see that it, this kind of doesn't work for me because these features kind of blend into one another uh, and I can refine it more and more until I get the level of complexity that I want. The switch from here to here to here was, you know, from here to here, two minutes. From here to here, another two minutes. And once I found um, a setting that I like, I can apply it pretty much automatically to all the layers that I have in the board and export everything very, very quickly. So here's an export script for this exact same layer. Um, I created a Python script um, automatically with Sherlock. I just did a right click, export FEA model for the uh, trace. For the trace. Um, it creates this script. There's no secrets here. There's no um, voodoo mathematics here. There's no black box engineering. It tells you exactly what it's doing. And then you can run this Python script. You can actually send this Python script to your Abacus uh, uh, people. And they can um, actually run it themselves. And you don't even have to have Abacus installed. Um, and you can see that I can, I can do these features. I can do that, those features, whatever, whatever I want, pretty much with a click of a button. This is a five minute operation to go from here to here. Um, and everything that comes into Abacus, what's cool about it is that if you take a look at these one, two, three, four, these are the four um, traces that I'm selecting. So if you're going to export this for someone who's doing electromechanical, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, electromagnetic uh, interference type uh, analyses, you can see that it's easy for them to select pretty much trace by trace and apply some kind of uh, thermal heating to them or uh, apply some kind of electric uh, charge to them and uh, see how that works. So all of that is, uh, and obviously, you know, any kind of thermal mechanical via delamination that I showed before, you can do those uh, as well. Um, I can do the exact same thing in, uh, in ANSYS. It takes me exactly the same amount of time. I just do a right click and export, and instead of doing export to Abacus, I do export to ANSYS. Um, and again, it does the exact same thing. It gives you the actual um, script, which you can read, and you can see exactly what Sherlock is doing. You can modify any, anything that you want in the script, so the script is generated automatically. And instead of sets, ANSYS has the thing called components, and it will arrange everything in uh, terms of components. So and if you'll take a look here, uh, Sherlock generates actual volumes and elements and volumes and elements for every single um, uh, component uh, for every single um, trace on the board. So there's going to actually be a named um, volume for each trace on the board. So that's a very powerful uh, thing to have because um, it allows you to uh, select things specifically by their names. So if you're good at these scripts, this uh, this is quite nice. It also works in uh, ANSYS Workbench, but ANSYS Workbench is not as good at processing this as um, as uh, ANSYS uh, APDL. So if you're doing it in ANSYS Classic, it, it doesn't really matter which one you're doing. Uh, you can read this into uh, Workbench, and we'll create the same uh, geometry for you. Um, so I, I would say play around with it. If you're doing it for the first time, I would say play around with it and uh, see which one works uh, the best for you. But to you, it shouldn't matter. It should matter to the people sitting in front of ANSYS. And if you're the person sitting in front of ANSYS, then this basically saved you uh, several hours every time that you're doing this. Um, the, this auto automated uh, defeaturing probably is saving you several hours. Um, and let me give you a little bit of an extra, I'm, I'm not going too long here. Um, let me save you, uh, show you a little bit of an extra here. So this is what happens. When you turn on all of the traces on an entire board, in this case, this is a smartwatch, um, when you add cutouts, you add all of the leads into here. Um, I, can't, I haven't shown it here, but all of these are vias, in fact. So in this case, this is a very simple board because it's a two-layer board. So I have all the leads. And I can basically not just make a pretty picture, but I can actually make a full 3D model that works um, right here um, in Sherlock. And this is exported directly from Sherlock into Abacus. And you don't need to be an expert modeler in order to create this. I can show you how to do this pretty much in one day of training. And then this is a fully meshed model with all the materials applied to it. 
and it's kind of ready to run depending on what it is you want to run on it. It's probably overkill for 99% of the things, but the picture is so cool. So I kind of really like to uh, show that. Um, this is my, if you remember nothing else, slide. So basically if you were on your uh, Facebook or doing something else the entire time. Um, remember this, you can short, make the model creation time shorter uh, for Abacus, ANSYS, ANSYS Workbench, ANSYS Classic, uh, Nastran, um, basically by uh, leveraging our current modeling techniques. Um, with the libraries and the interface that is, uses common electronics terms. Um, you can take the FEA result if you want to and bring it back into Sherlock to uh, make reliability predictions. And if you're doing component level things like I showed the BGAs and the pop BGAs and the uh, VIAs, um, with the computing power that is practically becoming unlimited these days, um, you can increase the model complexity, uh, no problem solving two million elements uh, these days. And if you're saving engineering time, engineer time is a lot more valuable than computer time these days. It used to be the other way around, but nowadays we all have computers that are pretty powerful that sit right on our desks. And so the um, engineer's time, if you can save uh, two, three hours a week for an engineer, that's a uh, uh, a big savings for um, uh, for the for your FEA. Um, my name is Gil. This is my email. If you want to ask any kind of technical questions, um, I'm going to hand this over to Mark Misitano. And if you have any kind of sales um, questions, um, Mark is the one to go. Uh, if you have any questions right now at the end of the webinar. I would also be happy to um, to answer anything you guys have. Yep. There's one question. How are boundary conditions modeled? It's a good question. Let me let me grab it real quick. So if you take a look, so you can either model the boundary conditions yourself, put them in afterwards in Abacus, Ansys, whatever, or if you say, let's say here's a board level model. So actually, if you take a look, you see these these uh, map pads, they actually will bring in, they will come in to, um, to ANSYS or, you know, Abacus, and they already have the boundary conditions applied if you apply them from Sherlock. But in a case like this, well, there's no boundary, direct boundary conditions applied on the board. So you would actually deselect the boundary conditions. You'll see that there's no map points here. There's just holes. And then uh, when you attach, however you attach this, in this case I think I attached a uh, rigid attach right here at, the, at this interface, kind of like a cassette sliding in. Um, if you attach this guy here, then, you know, the mount points will automatically be created. Usually it's like the interaction manager uh, in Abacus or the workbench will automatically create contact interfaces between the board and the um, and the enclosure or whatever the uh, stiffener is, and then so you would have to apply it in ANSYS or Abacus. There's no way around that. So you see, there's no actual map points right here. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a great rest of your day.